Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers, and this is, what is it? It's the 18th of December, 2013, and um, we've had some illnesses and some family issues and so forth with some of the guests we invited, but, um, but we wanted to continue talking, and I think we're going to, we'll, we'll continue this into the new year, um, just because for me, this is a uh, remarkable set of articles in the New York Times um, a, a, around Dasani, uh, Invisible Child, I guess, is, is the name of the articles. The, um, and so, in talking with Catherine Schulten um, at the Learning Blog, um, Learning, is that a network at the New York Times? Um, it's, it's the Learning what? The Learning Network, yeah. Network, it is network, yeah, okay, thank you. Um, she she um, pointed us to youth communications and um, and uh, Virginia uh, this fits them is that close yes mm -hmm. who is the editor of Represent magazine and website as well you'll kind of describe that um, at youth communications um, which is an old friend of the writing project and many of us and so it's really nice to reconnect with you all around this issue. Um, the issue uh, we're going to define as we go, if you're hearing this and you'd like to join us, um, you can find the link to join us at edtechtalk.com slash ttt. Um, I think, Virginia, after you introduce yourself, uh, what we really want to talk about, um, we just met each other <laughs> getting set up here. Um, I'm a teacher in the Bronx, and I actually have a, a couple of students who who are many, actually quite a few who are in foster care, but um, one in particular who's um, been talking to me about being in temporary housing, he calls it, and has been for many years. And I tried to start talking to him tonight, interviewing him, just kind of learning more. And interestingly, he, he jumped in. And when I said, so how would you describe your situation? He said, I'm a boy, <laughs> which, you know, which is really interesting. But, um, Jake, uh, an art teacher with uh, Admiral School also is joining us. Thank you, Jake. But Virginia, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Talk about um, your work uh, with Represent and Youth Communications and how you got there and let's get started. Welcome to okay. Teachers Teaching um, Teachers. <laughs> okay. Uh, Represent is a magazine, national magazine written by and for teenagers in foster care. Uh, uh, we have a little newsroom, and the writers come in twice a week and write stories about their lives, um, personal stories. They, they can do reported stories if they want, but most of them choose to write more memoir style um, mm. uh, stories about how they came into care, their experiences in the system. Uh, and then we put out a magazine, we collect those stories and put out a magazine four times a year. Hmm. It's a, a non a youth communication is a non-profit publisher and uh, the founder uh, is still there. He uh, founded a high school magazine called now called YC Teen in 1980 and in 1993 when the population of foster children in New York skyrocketed because of crack and AIDS, um, he decided to spin out a, foster kid, a magazine just for foster kids because so many of them didn't want to admit that they were in foster care. Um, and so giving them their own magazine, uh, I don't know, freed, freed them up to own it in a way. So, a little Maybe more about like your... Sorry, say that again? I, I missed the end. A little I bit was just like... thinking of your students saying, I'm a boy. I mean, yeah. I guess it's, you know, don't define me by that. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, we're all kind of learning, but you're f about these issues, but you're further along on them. How did you get there? How did you, you know, personally, how did you end up at Youth Communications and... What's your interest in some of these issues? It's pretty random. I came from publishing yeah. and writing, mm -hmm. and I was unable to sell a book, and I uh, 
I, I had been volunteering, helping kids write uh, plays at the 52nd Street Project, which is my only experience ever working with kids. I have no social work background. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all quite new to me. But I clicked on Represent when I saw the ad, and I was just uh, blown away by the stories. And I thought I would love to work on these stories. So that's cool. That's cool. Yeah, uh, as a writing project teacher, I you know I think we do much of the same kind of work. And we we have a site called YouthVoices.net where uh -huh. the the issue of editing and how you work with kids and how you make uh, stories public, um, I kind of feel like. We should talk more <laughs> but, um, as we go. Jake, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, hi, could you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, well, I work with Paul at uh, New Directions, and I'm the art teacher. And um, we're, um, yeah, we have foster kids. I, um, but uh, I was wondering, as the art teacher here, um, you said you, I was I was searching around to see um, your site, and if there was, ma uh, you could see the actual magazines online because I was digging around right away to see what kind of art was in there um, and um, yeah I could see like uh, kids using art you know and getting published as a, as a self-esteem builder and as a real positive thing in our school <clears throat> um, but uh, I don't know if, uh, I was gonna ask what kind of um, pieces that you might have in the in your quarterly publications so far well, sadly, there was a, a separate wing. There was the two magazines, and then uh, other teens came in, some in foster care, some in not, and, and illustrated the magazine. But like many nonprofits, youth communication is in financial trouble. So hmm. we cut back the art budget and ended up with, um, you know, our professional. She was directing the kids. Now she does these photo illustrations, so you, that's probably what you saw if you were looking at more recent issues. But if you go back, you'll see um, kids used to read the stories and come up with illustrations, but we just yeah. stopped doing that in the last year or two. Wow. Well, okay. Well, uh, the URL is represent m a g o r g, right? Represent mag dot org. mag dot org. Yeah. There we go. Mm -hmm. So. Um, what do, what would you say the, is the sort of vision purpose of bringing this together? You've said a little bit, but um, it's about what do you think the goal is for the young people? Is it to teach them how to read and write? Is it to, is it about self esteem? Is it getting their voices out there? It's all those things. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. No, it is. It's all those things, yes. And uh, I feel like another thing that you didn't mention, that those are the biggies, um, it's just the respect of being treated like a professional. We pay them when the stories are ready for publications, uh, for publication, and, and uh, it's really fun to hand, you know, a 17-year-old his first check and say, you're a professional writer now, and they, you know, they'll be on their cell phone saying, can't talk, my, I'm at work, and <laughs> it, it's just, it's great. They're teaching, you know, they, they sort of learn some workplace etiquette, and they, they get close with their colleagues, and for a lot of them, I can tell, they, they show up more often than their two days, and I can tell that it's the only part of their life that isn't completely chaotic. That it's, that it's the place where it's always going to be the same, it's always going to be kind of quiet, and they can talk about their problems, and they'll get sympathy, and then they can sit down and kind of write it out. I just, it's, it's so great. I, they just really get, um, yes, definitely a lot of self-esteem. Um, so they, they do a lot, a lot of the writing right there during those two days? They do all the writing right there. Hmm. Yeah. So they, hmm. my network, my computer is networked in with theirs. They each get their own computer, and that's also nice because it's their workplace, it's their turf. They have a computer, and they, and then they come back the next time, and uh, 
their draft is full of you know bold bracketed questions from me, which are both writerly and therapeutic. I mean, how did that feel? You know, or what? You know, just so so it it's a it's a it's this kind. It's nice because it's this. It is a kind of therapeutic relationship, and some of them do want to sit in there and talk, but other ones like that distance where we're typing back and forth. And they can talk about it if they want, but they can keep it all on the page. But they, but we are talking about pretty um, deep and personal, painful stuff. Go ahead, Jake. Um, Jump right in. Um, could, could, I, could I just get like a quick... Uh, um, I guess overview of uh, some basics like uh, what's your what's the um, the readership and um, how many approximately kids do you have are they from all over the country or are they mostly from New York? Um, so I think there's about six thousand subscriptions and that's that's national probably about half in New York though. Okay. Um, but it's great. I'll get phone calls from you know Texas or Wyoming. You know we we love your stories. We use them in our group home. Um, the kids are all from New York City okay. because they have to come into the newsroom to write. Okay. Um, so that's one of the questions as we talk about this because um, on Youth Voices and and. Uh, other hangouts and so forth with with kids that I'm wondering if homelessness and foster care looks different in New York City or if it's you know typical do you have any sense of that um human rights watch did a big report a couple years ago about uh, California that was the numbers were just as dreadful Mm -hmm. of your likelihood, I don't remember those numbers, but they were bad, the, the likelihood of ending up homeless within two years of aging out of care was 50 percent, it was really high. Um, so I, I think, and then there's these Chapin studies, I, I think it's pretty across the board mm -hmm. um, that foster care is is not preparing kids to live as adults the way having a family does. Mm -hmm. It just isn't. How, um, how young are your, uh, your foster kids go? Because we're, we're a uh, secondary school, which means 6th grade to 12th, but we actually have kids that are even younger than, I mean, we, we, I think we go from something like 11 to 17 so far in our school, and that's only two grades. <laughs> Um, but uh, do your um, kids, you know, contrib do you contributors, um, they, they have to kind of travel on their own, so are, are they on the older side of the teen years? Well, an interesting thing, I think, so I got the job right when the economy crashed, mm -hmm. and, um, and I've seen it get worse, and what's happened is Which that... you're talking 2008, old, yeah, yeah. yeah. 2008. Um, yeah. Business, business no, I, haven't, I haven't been there since the 30s. <laughs> okay, um, that's good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, they, uh, my writers have gotten older. As a matter of fact, we had to kind of make a rule that you don't have to leave the program when you turn 21. You can stay writing in the office till you're 23 because we didn't want to pull represent a way at the same time everything else was getting pulled away. So I actually have a fair amount of stories with a homeless issue last spring that was, um, you know, some writers in their 20s. Um, so I have a lot of writers now writing, which I think is useful for the readership, what happens when you age out. Um, and they, the, youngest, the youngest I have had in a while is 16. They, technically, we, we take 14-year-olds, but we found that that's just a little too young. I've, I've, well, we can I've think about some... getting our kids ready for that. <laughs> yeah, we have we have uh, one foster kid that's 14, um, and um, I think at least one more that I know of, but I should ask uh, our intake person, Jose. It might, 
join us or might not, depending on how things went for him tonight. But mm -hmm. the um, we I do want to get to Dizani um and and the articles in particular mm -hmm. uh, and and your feelings about it um being in the publishing world and working with young people, um, it, and and but who the young people are that we're talking about feels like an important question to me because when we talked about this a little bit last week there was a comment that made me um, sit back and say well true but not so true which is that you know all young people the comment was that if you're not connected to your work if you're if you're you know then then you are homeless in some way and 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 <laughs> I kind of get that, but I want to... What was the context? Well, talking about Dizani and, like, who are the young people we're working with. And, and so I want to, I, I don't want, I, I want to kind of um, allow homeless young people to get their voices out there and say who they are and not say everybody is like that. On the other hand, I, I also kind of, um, when we describe our students, another description of our students that, that I think is worth thinking about in New York City is how many young people are sitting in suspension centers for months and months and months, right? And um, and then don't really have a school home to go to. Again, I don't want to make... What I am saying is that we need to preserve the differences, but also think about how a lot of people have lots of issues um, with young... You know, young, young people have lots of issues in lots of ways. Do you have any response? Do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> Let's put it that way. I, I think how it's, I think it's going to affect us differently. I mean, in school, I would think it would add up to kids not showing up for school. That, right? I mean, that's maybe that's sort of the the, that's true of foster kids. That's true of homeless kids. Mm -hmm. That's true of just kids with you know, who are poor and and parents are erratic, you know, I mean that. It's also true um, of kids who have, you know, fear of school, whatever it is, you know, so, yeah, but right. Um, yeah, so I'm not, I, I guess, I guess, I guess I'm wondering to, to what end would you either lump those kids or separate them, like what's the context of that. Um. I I want to understand young people. I want to understand our response to them. Um, and um, you know, uh, the kids who who seem to have the most um, I'll just say difficult lives outside of school. You know, mm -hmm. there there's um if we get them to stay in the hallway outside of our classroom, we're happy. You know, but but that, but I'm not actually happy. I want them to be working harder, and, <laughs> and it's it's hard, you know, you, the patience that we have to have as as teachers, and so forth, is 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 what I'm interested in. So and, and so, uh, for a long time in the writing project, at least, uh, some of us have been trying to think about how we can tell the story of the young people who come to our classes. And then also tell the story of teachers and how, like the hard work we do to kind of reach out to those young people. And, and sometimes there's a hit, and often there's not. So, but I'm just babbling here. I don't. <laughs> I don't well, yeah, well I think to clarify, maybe like, um, you know, what, what's the um, involvement with um, teachers in 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 your site and your program? And do mm -hmm. the kids talk a lot about what's going on in school? In the, That's um, a good question. In, in the essay, in the journals. <sighs> That's too. I, I do feel like I, I, I actually, um, a writer who I is really struggling right now um, hasn't had a, doesn't have a place to sleep right now. Just this sort of strange. Uh, vortex of, of an old criminal charge and just all this stuff coming up mm -hmm. and for him and for some others school school is the lifeline school is the thing that it is the thing they can 
control and the thing they can focus on and the thing that some of them have this, you know, very unwavering belief this will get me through. Um, so, and so that's one way that they write and talk about school and then another way is just as a place that's um, a, sort of a, a, a torment because they get picked on because they're in foster care and have crappy clothes and um, and the teachers and, and I, I was I was pretty shocked that kids would be mean to kids about that that they would say things like your parents must not love you you're in fault like really mean but that's what mm -hmm. they say happens so so the, the, I, those are the two things I get from the stories. And, and talking to the kids about school, which are pretty different. Yeah, those. Are, I mean, how do how do they keep those two things together? How does your you know how's something that's your lifeline also your tormentor? I, I it's different kids. Uh huh. It's different kids. I think the I think the the lifeline kids are are the more successful kids because they are like I have accepted that my past and my present suck. And I'm I'm working on my future. You know, they're really thinking about um, changing their lives, and that school's how they're going to do it. And the other kids are more just kind of buffeted around and, and don't have that that sense of direction. So it's it's different. It's it's two different sets of kids I'm talking about. Do you usually end up with the 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 better students in schools because this is a writing project and they're um, they're more interested in writing they're more literate because we have we have a lot of uh, situations where kid isn't succeeding you know in the previous school not doing so hot even in our school and not connecting and it sounds like your guys really something clicked with them and they ended up using school as their anchor so it's like, um, great. How how can we put that in a bag and you know sell it to our kids? Um, you know, is there any writing or um, are there people you know that have gone through that and, and and have spoken about that? Well, I I don't want it to sound too rosy. A lot of a lot of kids, a lot of my writers are going for their GEDs. Or planning to go for their GEDs. Um, it's it's not because school I, has I, because school hasn't made it for them or they're, they're not they've prepared. had it they got second they've but, you know for whatever reason they yeah. they've been locked up they've been um, yeah that that uh, the lack of continuity has made it hard yeah yeah the continuity yeah all kinds mm -hmm. of reasons to not stick stick in school. Um, so no, I, I would I would not say and I mean it honestly not very many of them are even readers. Which is which at first I was like, wait, you want to be a writer and you don't read? <laughs> so, no. so 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 you know got So so maybe some of them are in it. Uh, I think you you mentioned this because it's so cathartic, and that you know, and they're putting it all in perspective, um, and they need that process, you know, just for themselves. Uh, uh, and and I do have an advantage over a teacher that it's one on one. It it does feel more well. Being in, being their editor feels more like being their therapist than being their teacher. Although I obviously try and teach um, writing uh, tenses. Do you guys have you guys found? I, I just the verb tenses are just baffling. I I, I, just, <laughs> I can't even I, I can't even understand the, the the logic and the consistency of making the future. Using the future tense when you mean the past tense, and so I, you know, I definitely try to try to work on their writing, but um, 
I don't. I honestly don't think that's the main thing. I think it's more social emotional. Yeah, me meaning is important. I mean, we work with some kids that are are not functional at all in English. So, you know, any way you can get your meaning across, you know, it's uh, better than better than not. You know, and um, you know, yeah. I guess you have to be forgiving with grammar and spelling if you're um, just trying to move the ball along otherwise you know you'll have to slow down too much and you won't you won't get across the finish line um, I mean that's what yeah, I find. and I no I, I and my luxury is is I, I can try and teach them and but I also can just fix it before I put it in the magazine uh, right well yeah you know, if you're editing for public you can paper. tell the magazine is is edited. It's not. I mean, it's. I try and preserve their voice, but I, I correct a lot of crap. Don't don't feel bad because uh, you know I'm I'm an art teacher and uh, you know I if I feel like taking a kid's artwork and touching it up, I don't feel guilty at all because they're happy and I'm happy and nobody's trying to pass it off as you know as their work and you know we're putting it online. I'm the teacher and that's that you know because. I want to move the ball along, you know, if, if, if it gets them happy about doing something the next time, you know, then it's a great incentive that I could use. Yeah, okay, let's do this together, you know. <clears throat> but, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, it sounds like, um, it sounds great for just um, getting, getting this, this big weight off your chest and then also having responses when people read it and connect to it that could be a million miles away. You know, to they get that endorphin rush of, uh, you know, somebody made use out of out of what I made. So, I'd be really interested in, in connecting this to art. You know, even if it's just for my kids and that process, and you know, giving them a, um, you know, a check or something. That that sounds like it would be great. You know, to to validate. You know, the fact that, you know, in our school we call it life experience. You know, you've just gone through some stuff and you deserve some credit for that because you're still you know, you're still coming to school and you're still trying. Absolutely. Yeah. And and the other meaning, yeah, and also for the foster kids in particular, um, so many of them have been uh, uh, abused, sexually abused and otherwise, and they've been told you better not tell anybody. And so it's, it's I, I, I just love that it's a place where, you know, no, it's important. You should tell. And I, I just have always believed in the, in the power of that, of, uh, of um, you know, overcoming shame by not keeping the secret. So that's a, that's a nice thing about, um, a magazine for foster kids. Um, I, th I think it really does help them get past it's my fault, you know, which so many of them start out with. Yeah, or, or just carrying it around. And we, we have two perfect examples in our school. Um, and, you know, the girl that is very open about it right from the first day, you know, writing about it in her bio from the, in the first week of school, is a lot more, you know, carefree and a lot more, you know, um, you know, self-centered or centered, you know. And uh, the other one that I'm thinking of is just, you know, in the halls and just, you know, you could tell that she has this, you know, great thing on her and she doesn't like to talk about it and it just comes out in every other way, you know, possible to be as, you know, defiant and contrary as she can be and you know, <laughs> you know, we know the backstory, but um, you know, it's just uh, I, I guess it's just a process. And if you know, if if one girl could learn from the other, and they could share that, and you know, the other one could at least understand, you know, that you know that there's going to be a time where you're going to realize, you know, I didn't cause this, and I don't need to carry the you know the shame of it, or, you know. Have you guys uh, followed that that Maryville case, Maryville, Missouri case, where um, a 14-year-old girl was um, claimed that she was raped and 
she just went public. She went right to the newspapers. You know, the courts usually uh, seal the names and the identities of victim, underage victims. But uh, it's the first case that I can remember of a girl just, you know, she went right to the Missouri Star or whatever, and um, she laid out her case, you know. It was after she had let the charges go, but they were able to open the charges back up because of this, because she was, you know, coming forward with a story. And, you know, she just, um, you know, it, it seems like she was a lot more peace with it than all of these, you know, Jane Doe situations that you hear where, you know, the case just drags out and, you know, and it gets a lot more contentious. So I, you know, I was wondering if uh, kids are noticing that, you know, that this uh, this example is out there. Also, I think a woman in India, um, you know, there was a movement in India to to try and speak out and not, you know, carry the shame and and not, you know, be quiet and gag yourself, you know, just go public, you know, for for the the benefits, even though there's also, you know, a, a downside, I'm sure, but. Uh, you know, I don't know, it's, you know, each person to their own. But I think the kids, I mean, it's sort of, you know, derided as the, everybody's writing a memoir and Oprah culture and all that, but right. I, I'm with you. I think it's good for the kids and they do, they do heal faster if they don't keep it in and, and, right, how else is society going to change if you're not, unless you're, you're, um, saying, no, that wasn't my fault. That was his fault. That, right. you know, that, that they do need to do that. And I don't think the girls can hear that enough. I think, and it's very touching the way they feel that, you know, sort of the divine purpose of, of why this happened to me is so I can help other girls. That's a really common way of framing it, which is, is, is very sweet. I mean, I have to say one really surprising thing about the job um, is that, did you guys see that movie, Welcome to the Dollhouse? Mm-hmm. A while ago, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, so, but it was sort of, the point of it was like, bullied people turn around and are mean to other people. That's how it works. Oh, yeah. And I'm not saying I thought, oh, but, but the, the foster kids are so the opposite. They really are... Very, um, they all want to have jobs as social workers where they help people, and uh, they really, they, they, that's, that's what, maybe it's a self-selecting group that comes to represent, but the, the ones I've met want to, want to use the bad stuff that's happened to them to help other people. It's, it's, it's lovely. Hmm. Very inspiring. So that, that, that's... That helps teachers to, to know that, that um, these young people whose lives have had those difficulties want to use those in a positive way. Some, I mean, we can't assume everybody, of course, but that's that's a nice thing to say. Um, I, I do want to get to the New York Times articles a little bit um, and, and just get your overall impression um, after I just say one thing that I, I, I was struck by the middle of the third one. Um, how, how this is this is almost like it's a. I think it's a, a lovely piece of literature almost. Yeah, I mean you can almost yeah. see the the climax. You the, there are five five acts and kind of thing. Um, so, um, so I was just wondering what your impression was and and if your students will be reading it and any other thoughts you have about it, yeah. Virginia. Will my will my students be reading it? Yeah, and and what just overall, I'd just like to hear what you think about the articles and the impact you think they might have. Um, <laughs> well, no, the series blew me away. Um, I it is it is novelistic, and uh, she's such a great observer. The scene in the liquor store was like funny, but not at anybody's expense, you know, liquor spelled wrong, and you could just see this little smart kid in there, and, and, and the, the sort of different classes, and it was, it was great, like yeah. it, um, 
it yeah they're it almost cinematic a, yeah <laughs> sorry it was sorry. yeah 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 well it's, um, to me it seemed like the author kind of knew how to box that girl you know and take her moments and and lay them out in a, in a sequence you know I agree I agree with both of you guys um, even though I'm still I'm just starting it but uh, yeah I can see it's mm -hmm. very compelling stuff mm -hmm. yeah go ahead, Virginia. I, <laughs> sorry I okay. was talking to somebody who um, I met somebody the other night who is a, a, a oral historian. She started with StoryCorps and has gone on and done stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And she said, I don't know. I sort of am suspicious of, of taking one person like that and making them the star. The, okay, this is her, so what? And I just didn't agree with that. I thought, I don't th think there's... A, it's humanized... I, I, I'm, I'm gonna guess. I mean, I, we all, all, we already think about kids like that, but a lot of people don't. And I, I think, yeah. I think it's gonna humanize. I think people are gonna think, wow, what, God, what, how would I handle it if I lived in a shelter? I, I, I think it could have, you know, that effect by drawing you in with the storytelling and, and, you know, she's such a, you know. Um, Compelling, quirky, bright kid, you know. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, and and you know, just the descriptions of the of the shelter are, are are, I mean, I guess we know all that, but oh my god, <laughs> yeah. I I don't know the details like you see them here, right? But so yeah, I mean, I the uh, you know the times. You know, probably loves this as you know, a, you know, kind of their signature publishing, where they really want to change public opinion and, and hearts and minds. Um, I think sometimes when when it re really does focus on just one example out of thousands, tens of thousands, you know right. that um, twenty two thousand ninety one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, good. Okay. Um, to, <laughs> that. You know, we we tend to we do we we just like zero in on this one example, and then you know somebody's going to come along and help her, you know, help her family. Like you know, maybe the attention will you know somehow, you know, get you know allow them to you know to do better. But you know, then all the rest of them you know aren't um, you know they need to be it need to be treated as a class of of people or or even like a generation mm -hmm. of people that are in this fix, and um, you know that's why. It's great, even if they just sprinkle in a couple of other examples to remind people, you know, that um, when we Hollywood these stories up, you know, it's it's really for ratings. You know, I'm sure the editors love this, you know, for the ratings. Know it, but I don't think it is for ratings in this case. I get. I well, mean, well, it's a win-win. If you mean if you mean you it's know. if you mean it's um, people are going to want to read it, I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, but but also, you know, what is it saying right now when we have Bill de Blasio coming in and, you know, it seems to me like this, you know, it just fits perfectly as this, you know, appeal to change things the way that, you know, that things have, have gone under the last administration and, you know, maybe we can, you know, change things for a lot more people, you know, and it really, you know, brings it home, uh, mm -hmm. you know, with this one example yeah. To have this, you know, kind of like real granular detail, and to really hook people in, so they start sharing the story and start talking about it around the, you know, table and stuff. Well, that's what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah, that all sounds pretty good. Yeah, yeah. yeah it does to me too. Yeah. Um. So, what? Do, and what about the school in her life? I mean, I was. Our school, we're brand new, right? But. Our principal, I don't want to speak for him, but he has said many times he doesn't want to suspend kids, right? So mm. there was dramatic, was it the end of the third one, I think, where she gets suspended and the line, the last line is, you know, suspension is a new kind of homelessness. And mm. how do you, so I think we as a brand new school are, are I think anybody would be, struggle with, 
when to be like that strict disciplinarian and when to say, okay, you can't do it today, so we're going to understand where you are, what's going on, you know. And it's, that's not pity necessarily, but it's understanding. And so I guess my question is, what do you think about the school and designing in it? Um, I'm asking you, Virginia, yeah. Remind me exactly what she got suspended for, because I know she does a fair amount of fighting. Yeah, yeah, she's fighting all the time. I, yeah. it, it's, it's, it's just really, it's, again, cinematically, it's like, oh, my gosh, you, you can almost see it. Um, it it's like the, the, she has a fight with, with somebody, and the mother goes in and tells the girl, you know, you know, it's okay for my girl to fight you, and she, she basically says, it's a, you know, fighting is... She approves it, and the principal says, no, you can't be doing this. And then she goes into class and threatens another girl, and that's it. She gets suspended for that, which is like, really? Just verbal? <laughs> um, oh. But but I kind of get it. You know, she needed to be shown yeah. something. You know? But, you know. I'm, it was one of the many good things in the, in the, in the piece. I feel like, uh, yeah, I was, I, re I was kind of like, Oh no! This is the thing that's keeping her alive. This is her lifeline. This school, right, right. but also she's got to stop fighting. You know, I, I I was torn. Well, I I believe that the fighting is uh, a red flag. I mean, when uh, when I heard from Paul that one of the incidents was because another student noted that she was smelly or musky or something, and yeah. you know, then it was on. Well, that exact thing has happened in, in our school, um, and in some, you know, and in another case when a kid didn't want to fight the person that made a, a similar comment, he just like put his head down instead, you know, which was probably even worse than fighting. I mean, who knows how much, you know, how damaging it. No. But you know, can I just can I just jump in there and shake and yeah. say, I had a student who pulled his shirt over his face and just sat there and wept. You know, it's like, it's yeah. like, oh my God. <laughs> and and and, you know, now, but, you know. and and so that you know that really hurts. And what you know, they're they're kind of like internalizing it, and fighting is kind of externalizing it, right? You're get you know you're you're really getting into trouble, and you know that's that's putting up alarm bells. And maybe they they want to tell the principals or the assistant principals or something like, look, send in some help. You know, we we really have it bad, yeah, I don't have it, you know, if I can't have a shower or a bath and I have to come to school and take this kind of abuse, you know, so it's a way of, um, you know, I always thought it was just ringing an alarm bell and, you know, it's so often the kids that are in foster care or the kids that are in, you know, or don't, don't have regular housing, you know, that it comes back, it turns out that that's the backstory, you know. So um, I, you know, just as far as helping the kids or, or changing things, you know, maybe schools can um, can take a look at this and and you know see what's going on. Um, you know, be really uh, acute, more acutely aware. Our school is not so bad because we have a very high density of kids with all kinds of issues. But the school I came from, you know, those kids were just sprinkled in a whole bunch of other kids that. You know they're they're teasing. They're being you know brutally honest, and uh, you know but they ha but they basically have it a lot better. So you know there there becomes you know that the whole outsider thing, that whole you know uh, outcast feeling on top of it. You know in our school everybody has some kind of issue going on. So you know they all have that kinship. Um, I mean it's true that's that's what our school's set up for basically. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, in my, my, my last school, there was maybe five kids, you know, in every class that were just kind of purposely distributed like that, you know, and they had either some kind of, you know, home issue, some, you know, some kind of dysfunction going on, um, you know, where they were, uh, you know, demanding a lot of, of you know, uh, teacher resources and school resources, and they never figured out, you know, that they need, they need some alternatives, you know, and that because we keep having the same problems over and over without, you know, without either side learning from it. Do you guys have a school 
a psychiatrist? Yeah, there's a there's a whole organization, um, Wadiko um, is the name of it. So it's out of Boston, but um, that so there the design we're not quite there yet with the numbers is that there'd be one of those counselors with every seventeen of our students. Um, so you know we we've thought about that in the design. The funding is another issue. It strikes me though that what what I hope. And 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 I wonder if somehow we as teachers can can add this. Um, what I hope the average civilian <laughs> gets from the designing articles is some sense of what we deal with in schools, right? So that I don't think I, I don't think people know that teachers are working with young people like this, right? They, it's, yeah. it's about the standards. It's about you know the tests and all that, but it's not about... So I'm glad the story's being told from a teacher's point of view. I mean, from a from a student's point of view, I also want to kind of... I mean, there is there are, there are really positive teacher portraits in the, in the story, too. Oh, yeah. The yeah. principal and the teacher, yeah. Yeah. Um, and the counselor there is interesting, too. A young, well-meaning, but, you know, I love the teacher's comment that I... I, I need a PhD, not to, you know. I, I, we we get it. Everyone's trying to help, but yeah. So I don't know what to say about that. But but I wonder if there's a, if there is in fact a, a way to to there could be like a teacher teacher stories now saying we work with designers, right? Um, and this is how we work with them. And this is this is where we fail, and this is where we succeed, and you know so that. I think the average citizen needs to see that too, in some way. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, I, and and a quick example is a young woman who, she, at first, she was coming in and uh, calling home immediately and leaving school, <laughs> and then she would stay in the main office for a while, and then she would not show up for a long time and then she would you know sit outside in the you know in the hallway and but refuse to come in but she always made a real point it was in my class where she said that she we're we're trying to be a one to one laptop um school as well um but so that her laptop had to be set up and she had to have her space right in that room and i got it i understood that that was really important for her even if she didn't come in, she needed to know it was there for her, right? So, and then, you know, one day she came in and sat, you know, off the table in the wrong direction, and I yelled at her for that, and she kicked over a chair, and I'm like, oh, God, I, you know, all this time, and then I, I blew it with that. But then, you know, two days later, she comes back, and she's a, a changed person. I don't, it wasn't because of that incident, but... So, like, like stories like that, I think are are kind of important to tell too, um, as well. It seems to me. So, but again, I'm just babbling. <laughs> yeah, well, you you don't want you don't want to. Uh, th there's a fine balance dealing with the kids because you don't want to give them special privileges. You don't want to, um, you know, make it too obvious that you're handling them with kid gloves. Um, you know, but at the same time, they're they're very you know they're they're much less functional than the other kids. You know, like you know a pencil dropping all the way across the room, you know, distracts them and they'll go running around. You know, um, and uh, you know it's a process. Um, our our principal is you know promising us that eventually you know that click moment will will happen. You know, with with all of our kids, with all their various issues, and that they'll, you know, realize that they're coming to school for a reason and take advantage of of what we're offering. But um, you know, uh, I, it seems maybe it's maybe it's you know the the fourteen, fifteen, sixteen year old range, but um, where a lot of the kids are not um, helping themselves yet, they still seem like they're asking for help and you know just making a lot of you know, school time, uh, you know, using a lot of school time and resources to try and and tell the world something's not right here, you know, something's not working. So, um, 
Getting back to the the particularity the particularity of of the articles, I was really happy that it was an eleven year old turning to a twelve year old you know who was being profiled, um, in some way because, I don't know it's like, I don't know you you can kind of see her, the hope in her but also how it couldn't it, it might not all turn out so well either you know I hate to say that but you can kind of see that too. Yeah, the fighting, it's got to stop, <laughs> for example. Uh, but, uh, and, and, you know, just when, and I, I know there was a negative New York, it was a New York Post editorial, right, um, saying, you know, yeah. why are they, why? Homeless Huey. What? Homeless Huey. Actually, is that oh, what yeah. it was? Yeah. Right, so why, why are we supporting these people, right? Why are those eight kids in that one family? And and you actually I, I I not you I was was wondering some of that too as I was reading along and then you learn the father the you know the father and the mother's story and they're homeless kids too right yep. so it's like you can't like can't point fingers there either right so right that's that that was really interesting to read I thought for me you know because yeah. I mean, it's easy for us, for teachers also, to kind of blame the parents, but that doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> you should, you know, yeah. So, yeah. Um, I I think you know maybe maybe it'll help us look at um, you know the way that the the you know the tax dollars either go to help them you know kind of maintain this this treading water existence. Yeah. Or, or or recognizing it early, like if we really, you know, focus on the kids and not the parents and we try to intervene in some way, and, you know, that would have to be, you know, social workers and schools, and I know it gets very, you know, expensive really you, fast, but, um, you know, maybe that's what we need to do because, it's like, you know, for the, you know, every investment we make in, re in preventative, you know, action, Probably saves you know more money on the back end. I'm I'm pretty sure that you know there's been studies you know to, yeah, to but, kind of show that. But but the example in the article again of the uh, in the last article there is some of the end I haven't gotten to yet. But that that the the principal invites the the parent into the school. I really do think that, and I don't know how our school has thought about this yet. But schools got, have to work with families. Is is what I was struck by. It's like we can't. Foster, that's yeah. certainly the foster care's um, angle too. ACS wants to put more money into preventive family services. Sort of the opposite. That you do have to spend the money on the family as a unit to help the kid. Mm -hmm. And don't don't the kids sometimes have to answer to a judge or a court officer for like mundane things like you know attendance and did you hand in your project and stuff? Isn't there some kind of oversight where the you know the system is is making sure you know checking up on the kid because the parents aren't if they're in foster care? Um. Oh, a caseworker. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying, sort of the the philosophy of of what we're talking about, like how would you help Dasani? Would you would you go? Would you put your resources into into her separate from her family, or would you try and make the family more functional? That that's I'm just talking about that debate of those two approaches. Um, sure, I mean some parents are just are just. Um, Terrible and and not well, Dizani's around parents or worse. Dizani's parents are as almost as bad as they get. I mean, in um, some yeah, at some times. Yeah, so, well, I have to say, yeah, they they don't abuse their kids. Yeah, that's true. They don't just hurt. themselves. I mean, that scene in the rain going to therapy when the mother snaps at her for basically knowing, having a better sense of direction than she did, that was painful. Um, but, 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 the, you know, but, the year, the year away, but the year away for rehab, you know, is mentioned fast, yeah. but that's pretty terrible. You know. Yeah. But, yeah. That was just, but uh, yeah, so, you yeah. know.
So yeah, I, you, you I, never know I, what they what they leave out too. I, I want to circle back in the last few minutes we have here. So I had never told you how long this was, but we go for three and a half hours. Is that okay? So, <laughs> oh, great. Yeah, so we're, we'll kind of finish up here. Um, Put the coffee the, on. Yeah. So thank you for sitting in with us. Uh, and and I do want to keep talking about this as the new year comes around. Um, and Teachers Teaching Teachers was never intended to be a, uh, a kind of a show. Every once in a while we do have like special guests on and stuff like that. But this kind of conversation is what is important. And I would love to get some, I don't know how to do this, but to get some young people who are in foster care and young people who are, you know, in other kinds of situations, um, involved in in talking with us here too, but um, what and was I going to ask? Uh, and to get I'm subscriptions of uh, of the magazine as well. Right. Well, I was going to ask. I was going to ask you to go back go back to represent for a little bit and and say um, I, there were two things like the memoirs. Like, I guess we can guess, but what are some of the topics that kids do write about in the memoir kinds of things? But I wanted to also ask. What are the researchy ones? I think you said, that's how you said it. Um, the kids do as well in, in the magazine. Um, so, um, <laughs> how, how how I recovered from sexual abuse is a story that a lot of um, people tell. Mm -hmm. um, and we mentioned girls earlier, but I'm sure there are girls and boys on there, right? Uh, mostly girls write that story, but but uh, yeah, but a few okay. boys have. Um, mm -hmm. um, what else? Let me think about what's in. So the new issue that's going to be out um, later this week or early next week is um, there are stories on technology, so they're examining. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, their Facebook identities as opposed to their real identities. Um, mm. Lots of stories about bullying. Um, stories about trying to reconcile with a parent who's been a bad parent. A lot of kids seem to think that they won't be free until they forgive. So that's a big theme is forgiveness. Um, you know, I... Uh, if I could just interrupt long enough to say that when when you and Jake were talking about and you know who, like who who to work with, it's like what you just suggested there is that's not our choice on some level, right? Do we work with the individual or the family? The families make should be making those choices, it seems to me. But anyway, I guess it's an obvious point. I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, yeah. I, and I was I was mostly talking about. Um, sort of how ACS policy has yeah, swung policy. back and forth over the years to yeah. prevention versus removal of the kid. Um, so, yeah, they're mostly, I don't know, they're mostly stories about relationship and, and, and trying to make them better, trying to learn to trust, um, generally. Uh, we have a few feisty writers who are like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fix ACS, and and so there will be sort of specific, um, you know, here's here's a really terrible thing that keeps happening. The foster care system should be set up differently. Um, kids should kids should get more information right when they come in because they often write about the kind of going into care narrative is is uniformly terrifying. It's usually in the middle of the night and you know I think that was one of the ones I clicked on when I was thinking about when I first thought this sounds like a fascinating place to work. A black van came in the middle of the night my mom was screaming and crying and holding onto my feet while these people put me in the van and the next thing I knew, some white lady was saying, I'm your new mommy. And it's just like, what? Uh -huh. 